Hi, everybody. Welcome talking to Talking About Death in the Home. Um, the reason we're talking about this is after, gosh, 17 plus years in this business, we have, uh, as an inspection company, run across a lot of different variations on this topic. And kind of what we figured out and what I'm sure a lot of you guys have figured out along the way is that there are quite a few buyers out there that are reluctant to purchase a house where somebody has passed away because they have a psychological fear or a superstition of living in a house where somebody's died. And, you know, kind of obviously we hope that you as agents never encounter this situation, but given the fact we've encountered it several times in 17 years, if you're in this business long enough, I think eventually you are going to have to deal with it. So what we want to talk about very briefly today is kind of our experience performing inspections on houses with a recent death. Uh, unfortunately, what to do if you discover a deceased person, kind of our lessons learned and our best practices. And then we want to give you some suggested resources to help you out in case you ever encounter a similar situation. Uh, and historically speaking, up until very recent times, most people actually died at home, surrounded by their loved ones, their friends, their neighbors, by their community, basically. Almost all funerals were then subsequently actually held in that same home where the death occurred. Typically, family and neighbors went to the home of the deceased to lay out the body on a table, a bed, even a door that they would take off the hinges and span some sawhorses with. Death at home was completely ingrained in our society, uh, so much so that you can actually find funeral friendly elements built into houses. Things like deaths, death, sorry, I'm gonna stumble over my words here a little bit. Things like what were anecdotally called death doors, uh, which some people think is where the term being at death's door came from. Um, things like coffin windows, and they would even, during the construction of the home, store boards in the attic for a lot of different do-it-yourself projects, but one of them was always expected to be actually building a coffin when a death occurred in that home. Um, if you go out and you do some research on this, you may find something called a coffin corner, which is not just a baseball term, but it's actually a house term. Those are actually a myth. Those refer to a little niche built into the stairwell where people would say it made it easier to bring the coffin down from upstairs. Those are actually kind of a myth because the coffin and the body weren't kept, typically kept upstairs. They were typically kept downstairs. Um, but there are large schools of thought that think things like death doors and coffin windows actually are a real thing historically when you look at home building. The, the overall point here is that death at home up until very recently in our history was absolutely an accepted fact of life. And if you go back and look at some historical pictures, you'll find people doing things that we would find really macabre and almost unacceptable today, but death was so ingrained in life back then that posed pictures with a deceased sibling, like what you're looking at here, uh, were done to memorialize the death of that sibling or that child's life. It's just, it, it's fascinating that when we look at it, death was so common and so accepted that it was literally built into our houses and into our society. And only recently has that begun to change. Uh, and then our next picture here is actually an example of what you'll typically find called a coffin door which historically speaking would have been a door on the side of the house that made egress and ingress with something large and bulky like a coffin easier. You'll see there's straightforward steps, no handrails, it's a clear shot in and out that door. And there's even some schools of thought that uh, a death door like this or a coffin door like this often led into a little antechamber um, with a door on the outside and a door on the inside. And the theory was you would take off the inside door and use it for the beer or the platform that you would actually put the coffin on during the funeral. Uh, I should tell you guys, there is some controversy over this. Some people believe these are actually funereal details. Some people don't, but the history is jumbled enough that I think that there is actually a decent chance that things like death doors and coffin windows 
were absolutely a thing in older houses, especially in older New England houses where obviously the country was settled first uh, because there's such common details. So I don't think it's all entirely folklore, but it probably is a bit exaggerated over time because a door like this would be good for moving other big things in and out of a house as well. So it may just be a coincidence that moving a casket in and out was part of the function of that door. Regardless, they have come to be called death doors or coffin doors or coffin windows, things like that. All of this begins to change actually during the 1860s because of the Civil War and because of embalming. Uh, if you look at this from a historical perspective, the Civil War is the first time we really sent large numbers of soldiers to fight and die a long ways from home. Naturally, their families wanted the bodies of the deceased back, but you had to do something to preserve them on that long train ride back across the country. So this is actually where embalming starts to take home and the funeral sciences are kind of actually born. It's a direct result of all those guys killed during the Civil War. So by about 1900, roughly 50 years later or so, what are now called undertakers begin to use marketing strategies to rebrand themselves as morticians and then finally as the funeral, funeral directors we know today. Uh, and again, if you look at this from a long-term perspective, what we kind of mislabel today as a traditional funeral is actually an industry-made construction that's really not rooted in any religious foundation or meaningful cultural belief at all. It's almost more of a marketing thing than it is anything else. And it really only dates to the 1940s or 50s. And even then, you would still find funerals at home were very common in large parts of America, especially rural areas. So it wasn't until about the middle of the 20th century that what we think of a funeral today with the funeral home and the mortician actually became really common. The 20th century kind of slowly moved death out of the house and into hospitals and hospices and places like that. And as a society, we're now accustomed to a more institutionalized or hospitalized death. But just remember, as we go through this presentation, people in previous periods and previous generations, even our grandparents' generations, commonly, commonly died at home. So it was not at all unusual in the very recent past. Knowing this history, what does all this mean for clients? The reality of it is, is that dying of natural causes in your own home is actually kind of a luxury for most people. It's almost a best possible case scenario. And I know that's kind of a really weird way of thinking about it, but dying at home surrounded by your family and loved ones is really the best way to go for a lot of folks. And thinking of death in this way, and I apologize if this is uncomfortable, but I know it helped Liz when we went through this and it's actually helped me quite a bit. Thinking of death in the home this way is actually very comforting for many people. It kind of destigmatizes a little bit of it and kind of takes the, the creepiness factor out of it a little bit. So in the end, in the real estate business, the way we need to think about it is that houses of at least a certain era, so let's say about the middle of last century, the 1940s, 1950s, will very likely have had a death in the home that's not part of the public record, as it were. It was just such a common thing and so accepted that when a house gets old enough, the odds of a death having occurred in that home go way, way up. And it's just something that in this industry we have to acknowledge. Again, keep in mind, it really is a best possible case scenario for a lot of people. And I think that way of thinking really does bring a lot of peace of mind to clients when we talk to them about it in that way. <sighs> Let's talk for a second about aging in the home, because if we're talking about death in the home, aging in the home is kind of the natural corollary to that. We have to understand that current housing stock in most instances is not designed for aging people. So if we talk about what's called aging in place and eventually death in the home, we have to address things like stairs, narrow doorways, basement laundries, second floor bedrooms, bathrooms, all of that kind of stuff. Those may have to be addressed to keep people in their homes longer. 
And we also have to acknowledge there's a tendency for a home to fall into disrepair as you age in it. So there, we've inspected a lot of houses with older adults who are kind of unable or unwilling to pay for regular repairs or necessary upgrades. For some people, it's a matter of pride, but they struggle to do the work themselves. And especially in a crazy market like now, it's hard to even find reliable help. So delaying that maintenance or upgrade can endanger the safety and limit the livability and eventual saleability of a house. So this all kind of goes hand in hand together. And it's one of the things that, you know, we've noticed that oftentimes when we're dealing with a death in the home in the inspection business, a lot of that deferred maintenance can go along with it because the house has kind of slowly deteriorated a little bit over time as those folks have aged in that home. So that's also something else to keep in mind, especially when we're going to be dealing with things like estate sales, which we'll talk about here in a minute, and with older, possibly neglected houses. So that's kind of best possible case. Unfortunately, in the inspection business and in the real estate business, sometimes we're dealing with other death in the home. What we mean by that term well, maybe we're dealing with an undisclosed, a violent, or a quote-unquote unnatural death in a house that can kind of come as a surprise to people. And unfortunately, this has happened to us in the inspection business. Um, there's a scenario that sticks out in, the head, in my head where one of my inspectors, and this was down on the south side, was inspecting a house and found bloodstains in the carpet. And it turned out that that house had actually been the site of a relatively recent murder where a couple of squatters had taken up residence in there and actually murdered a pizza delivery guy that they had called to deliver a pizza to that house. So you do run across situations like that in this real estate business that, well, we're both in from kind of different directions. So it is something that you should be prepared to handle eventually. It's not going to be real common, but it does obviously happen out there. So if you go out and you Google this, a lot of websites are going to actually recommend asking your agent for help. So be prepared to do that if and when it happens. Um, a simple online search will sometimes reveal these details, but not always. The way we usually get the information is actually by talking to the neighbors about the house. And that conversation usually starts with, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody's buying that house. And then you dig into it and you get a few more of those details. So the point here is, be prepared to deal with that situation. There are websites you can look up addresses on. One of them is diedinhouse.com. Another one is housecreep.com. Just be aware that those are very incomplete records and there is some question as to the reliability of this data. But there are actually sites out there that you can look up specific addresses to see if there's any public record or any crowdsourced information about what have might what have might have happened, what might have happened in that house. So if we're dealing with one of those kind of deaths, what happens if that body goes undiscovered for some length of time? And yeah, this has happened to us as well. We had a situation like that in Greenfield here not too long ago, where one of my guys unfortunately discovered a body on a Saturday morning. This is called an unattended death, if you look at the industry jargon, and it's not uncommon. It does occur in real estate and inspection. So you have to think about if that happens, what are the cleaning requirements? How do we know if that house is clean? And as we talk through this, I'm gonna apologize in advance because it is gonna be a little bit unsettling, or at least I found it that way kind of going through it. But if you have an unattended death, what are the cleaning requirements to, well, to get that house back in saleable condition? You have to understand that decomposition begins immediately upon death, but the rate of decomposition varies due to several factors, including weather, temperature, moisture and humidity, pH and oxygen levels, the cause of death, even the body position can affect this. So cleanup in the end often depends on the time frame. Four to six hours is a lot easier to clean up than if a body has been there for several days. So a lot of it is just time dependent. And obviously, the longer it goes, the more in-depth the cleanup is going to be. Things like concrete, carpet, wood subflooring, 
all of those are going to absorb blood or bodily fluids beyond the surface level. So what this means in reality is that, well, a small area of blood and bodily fluids contained to the carpet, the homeowner can probably pull out that carpet and clean up the area themselves, taking some appropriate safety precautions. But realistically, any significant amount of blood or bodily fluids on the carpet or the floor are gonna be soaked into the carpet pad, into the floor, into the subfloor, and you're gonna to have to contact a professional cleaner for most situations when you have an unattended death. And again, sorry, this is a little unsettling, but you can see where blood and bodily fluids and so forth are actually going to get into the materials of the house very quickly when you look at pictures of those unattended deaths. The first step in a professional cleaning well, it's going to be cleanup of the physical aftermath and the dangerous biohazards that have been left behind. And that's going to include removing blood, bodily fluids, other bodily materials. After that's done, there's a sanitization step, which is going to kill any bacteria, viruses, or other organisms left behind with medical grade chemicals. Because things like HIV, hepatitis B and C, MRSA, are very common to encounter in an unattended death situation. They're very common biohazards. It's to the point where a lot of professional companies may actually defog the house with a disinfectant before even entering the home to neutralize any bloodborne or airborne pathogens in the house that may be there during an unattended death. Part of this cleanup and sanitizing is also going to be how do you get rid of the inevitable odor that occurs in this type of situation. These first two steps probably are not going to remove the odors, so additional deodorization is likely going to be necessary in an unattended death. There may also be odors from animals, from pets that are left behind, from food that's left there and rotting, waste that's left behind. Can that odor be removed? Usually it can, but it depends on several variables, and you always have to remove or eliminate the actual source of the odor. That odor can migrate through flooring, subflooring, into the ductwork, meaning that the point of origin for it isn't the only location that it has to be cleaned. So getting rid of that odor can be very involved and may, in, and may involve things like using ozonators, which are toxic, or other deodorizers to clean the air. Getting rid of that odor is actually often one of the trickiest parts of dealing with an unattended death in the house. And finally, the last step in cleaning all this up is remediation or restoring that home to its previous condition. And that remediation often involves replacement of materials, carpets, subfloors. It may not necessarily be cheap to do this, and sometimes insurance covers it, and sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. So in the end, going through all of these steps, the cleanup, the deodorization, the remediation, in a situation like this, is going to involve spending some money, unfortunately, because you may have to remove flooring. You may have to remove subflooring. You may have to clean and deodorize and seal that concrete subfloor all the way underneath these materials to get rid of those that the blood and the bodily fluids that have soaked down through all those layers. But it has to be done for both a sanitation, actually primarily from a sanitation point of view, but also there's a psychological benefit to doing this as well. So those are kind of the common cleaning and remediation steps. And obviously every situation is gonna be a little bit different. <clears throat> but that's what's typically done from an overall point of view in the case of an unattended death. So what if you actually encounter a body in a house? A lot of buyers um, are actually going to be curious, but you really need to keep them away and out of the house. First of all, it's really not their business. They don't own the home yet, but it's in their best interest to avoid contaminating what may be a possible crime scene and or inhaling possible pathogens. Pretty obviously, you're gonna call 911 and you're gonna contact the appropriate authorities for wherever that house is. It is not uncommon for that site to be declared a crime scene until determined otherwise, even if it's you know what appears to be an age-related death, they are probably going to declare that house a crime scene. And then on top of all of this, you need to inform any agents involved ASAP. 
Um, so if you're the buyer's agent, you're going to involve the seller's agent and vice versa. If you're the inspector, we're going to notify both agents of what we found. So these seem like pretty clear, obvious steps, but they're not necessarily that way when you're actually dealing with the discovery of a body. And yeah, this actually has happened to us before. We uh, again had a house out in Greenfield and it's been now several years since that happened, but it was an unattended body where the owner lived alone and had unfortunately passed away several days previous to when we went to do the inspection. It seems like, you know, at first glance type of situation might instantly blow up a deal, but handled properly and tactfully, that is not necessarily the case. In, in the instance of this house, that home eventually sold to the same buyers who were there when we discovered the body. But again, if you handle it tactfully with some explanation, you're sane and calm and rational about it, it destigmatizes that situation quite a bit. That house will eventually sell but it will take longer going through the investigation and a possible estate sale and all that stuff. And I, I don't mean this to be crass. I'm just trying to destigmatize that type of situation. Because again, if you're in this business long enough, it will happen to you. But if you handle it calmly and tactfully, that house is eventually going to sell. Because remember, death at home used to be such a common thing. Let's also hear talk about disclosure requirements for a minute. There is a lot of confusion regarding disclosure requirements with death in a house. So as we go through this conversation, please, please, please keep in mind, this is my home inspector slash engineer slash layman's interpretation of this. And that if you have any questions at all about disclosure requirements, always make sure you talk to your managing broker and a lawyer to get the, the straight information on this situation. But what we found kind of in a nutshell is that many states actually do not require a death disclosure at all and the reason for that is it's almost actually impossible to determine when a property stops being under a psychological impairment did that death occur last week did it occur 50 years ago did it occur 100 years ago it's impossible to say with any certainty when that house is no longer psychologically impaired because there are certain people and certain cultures where a death in the home is a problem no matter when it happened so when you stop and think about it it's not actually all that surprising that most states do not require a disclosure of a death in the house indiana is not what's called a caveat emptor or buyer beware state um, it actually does require some disclosures but the state of Indiana does not require the disclosure of what's called a psychologically affected property. So the responsibility to discover whether it's psychologically affected property actually rests on the prospective buyers or tenants in that situation. They have to ask very specific questions because you guys as agents are not actually required to disclose that this was a psychologically affected property. You are required to honestly answer those questions if somebody asks them, but you do not have to volunteer that information. So the focus of the Indiana disclosure form is actually on the physical and legal aspects of the property. And the law specifies that sellers need not disclose whether the property is psychologically affected. Um, more specifically, you do not need to state your knowledge or reasonable, reasonable suspicion that somebody died in the house or that it was the site of a felony affected by criminal organization, discharge of a firearm during a law enforcement operation, or the illegal manufacture or distribution of controlled substances, with the exception of methamphetamine, which is its own presentation, or presumably any other use that causes actual contamination. So you are not required to disclose what you think may be a psychologically impaired or affected property. Interestingly, when we talk to agents about this, this presentation, um, the vast majority of them responded to our emails sharing that they felt morally obliged to share this information with prospective buyers. So some of the questions we got, some of the other considerations we were asked about was, does the passage of time matter to this subject? And I think, yes, it absolutely does for most people. It's a weird psychological thing for us as humans. Recent death um, is more disturbing to us than distant death some ways in the past. And again, if we look at old houses, 
chances of a death and even a funeral occurring in that house get greater and greater the older the house gets. So the passage of time, I think, does matter to this subject. The further back that death occurred, the easier it is for people to accept it. How long afterwards is it relevant to discuss this topic in a home where it's happened? Again, I think it's relative, relevant to discuss it any time that you're aware of it. The more information you can give people, the better, and the less likely they are to feel surprised by something later on. And keep in mind that there are some cultures who will not buy a property with a suicide or a murder or a violent death, even if you gave them the house. So there can also be a, a cultural component that you have to be sensitive to there. All of this is, again, a way of saying, just disclose everything. I just think it's in everybody's best interest. And on top of all of this, there are even other considerations on top of this. We've had buyers that think they can actually get a deal on a murder suicide house. Um, buyers of certain homes, and they are out there, may have to deal with gawkers or interested people. Um, they've changed address on houses like the John Bonet Ramsey house they changed the address on. People still figure out what house it is and come by to gawk or look at the house. There can be actual monetary considerations. The Menendez house lost more than a million dollars in value when it was sold because of the murders that happened there. But on the other hand, Jackie O's Manhattan apartment wasn't stigmatized at all. She lived and died there and it actually increased the value of the property. So it's not always a negative connotation and again, handled the right way, doesn't have to be a negative connotation at all. I would imagine the vast majority of you guys in this presentation know what house this is. This is the Amityville Horror House. And if you look at the history of it, it's actually passed through several sets of owners since the mass murder happened there in 1974. It was originally at 112 Ocean Avenue. The address has been changed to 108 Ocean Avenue, um, but it's sold three or four times since the mid 1970s when those murders took place. Uh, it was last sold in February of 17 to an undisclosed owner for about $600,000, which was a couple hundred thousand dollars less than the asking price. But it keeps changing hands. People keep buying that house, even though it's it's literally infamous and nobody's reported any paranormal activity since the Lutzes lived there in the 1970s. And I think even that was mostly sensationalized. The point here being, even this house is probably going to sell several times and be reoccupied. So from a real estate point of view, disclose it, talk about the history of it, destigmatize it for people. And that makes the whole thing a lot easier to accept for most folks. So if we have a known death in the house, how do we help our sellers? Obviously, the first thing you want to do deep or professionally clean that house and remediate it as much as possible. Understand that grief does very different things to very different people. Some people may just want a quick sale on the house to be done with the process. Others may have a very hard time letting go due to an emotional or sentimental attachment to the house, but understand that that grieving process does very different things to different people. So every situation is going to be kind of unique and have to be handled with tact and sensitivity. Don't be in a hurry for a quick sale. Even with kids that want the family estate sold to be done with it, we get a lot of kind of anecdotal stories, admittedly, where the sellers later on have some seller's remorse that they could have gotten money for that how more money for that their parents house but they were blinded to it because of the grieving process so my recommendation would be don't be in a hurry for a quick sale let people grieve understand the process and that's probably the best result for everybody and then obviously a pre-listing inspection to find out what might have been neglected what might have been overlooked is strongly encouraged in a situation like this. What we don't want to have happen is this. And this is actually a relatively recent picture from a relatively recent inspection. We were there to do a pre-list inspection and the kids told us, whatever you do, don't lift up the towels in that bedroom floor because that's where our dad killed himself. That is the kind of surprise you don't want to have happen. Get that cleaned, get that remediated, get that taken care of, obviously before that house ever goes on the market. 
so that some third party like us or like you isn't stuck having to explain that to people during the course of an inspection or a listing appointment. Other inspection considerations um, from my businesses, my industry's point of view, death in a home is excluded by our visual inspection agreement unless it's actually caused a material defect to the house. So unless it's actually caused damage, it's not something that's gonna be disclosed during an inspection. Any discovery or discussion of death in a house needs to be handled with absolute discretion. Um, and like we've talked about at the beginning of this, you are eventually gonna run across this situation. So spend some time thinking about how you might handle that. Understand that every client is going to have a very different reaction to that situation. Some may be absolutely fine with it. Others are going to be completely freaked out and it's gonna require a lot of tact and a lot of care and a lot of handholding to get them through that scenario. And remember that, and we say this every presentation, it seems like my business and your business are people businesses. So understand and deal with the emotions that come with it. And that's how you get people through these situations. We are in a people business. We're not necessarily in a technical house 